Welcome to worship. And Merry Christmas. We often don't think about it, but for us as Christians, Christmas Day, the 25th of December, is just the beginning of a 12-day celebration. And so, hopefully, this service will continue on and help you remember that the gift we received in Jesus Christ coming to earth, that mystery of the Incarnation, is something so amazing that we could not contain our celebration in just one day. Our service today will be a little more casual. It will hopefully be a time in which we will sing some of our favorite Christmas carols and have a short message. And again, I hope it's one that reminds you that we are still celebrating in this wonderful Christmas season. So Merry Christmas again, and please join us now for worship. We'll be singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 88 in the hymnal. pray. God, on this Sunday, after we've celebrated Christmas, we thank you again for the gift of your Son. We thank you that in this year that has been like no other in our memory, that that gift came as it has come every year. And God, we know that a gift has to be received in order to be enjoyed, in order to be used. So God, in these days that follow our Christmas celebration, we pray that we would open that gift and that we would allow you to continue to transform our days as you transform our lives, calling us to be more than we are right now. Help us to look at our world with your eyes. Help us to look at the people who surround us with your eyes. 
And God, we pray that as we go into 2021, we would go with the desire and the goal to help usher in your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. God, we know that this Christmas has been different. Some people have been alone when they would have been with family members or with friends. And God, we pray that you would surround them with your presence and help them to know that all is well. We continue to pray for those of our church family who have special needs at this time, whether they are medical or grief at the loss of a family member, or whether they relate to jobs and food, all of the many issues and problems that we're dealing with right now. God, thank you that you are our God, that we are your people. Thank you for Christmas. In your son's name we pray, amen. Singing Away in a Manger, number 103 in the hymnal. Our text today comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they, Mary and Joseph, brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to our people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, 
of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Then as a widow, to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. I'm always fascinated by the nativity play. We didn't get to do one this year, but typically every year we have a play where the children teach us the Christmas story. What's interesting to me is how often these plays can deeply speak to me. And and they're also fascinating how they get put on. Here at this church we have behind me a closet with all sorts of costumes. When the children come in, a quickly a role is decided for them. Some put on the crowns of the three wise men. Others, the tunics of the shepherds with a staff. Some of the little, little children dress up as sheep. And of course, there's Joseph and Mary. And occasionally, we have someone play the baby Jesus. The great thing about the play is that you know the role you're supposed to do. You're given the costume, and you go into the role. But life isn't always like that, right? I remember I once heard a story from a comedian. He was at a point in his life in which he didn't know what to do, and his mom had decided he should go into the priesthood. She didn't tell him or a very confused priest who she invited both to dinner at an event, As they were sitting at a table, not realizing that they had been set up, the comedian (laughs) said the priest told him, I often know why I'm at places, but I'll have to be honest to you. I don't know why I'm here tonight. The priest did not know his role in that moment. And oftentimes, it's not the complicated hopes of a mother that can send us confused, but it's the time in this world, the waiting, the everyday responsibilities that can make us wonder what is exactly the role God is calling us to. The story we read today from the second chapter of Luke is a favorite of mine. So often we have so few Sundays that fall inside the season of Christmas. This year we we get two of them, which is great. But This is a text we often only get to every few years or so. And I think it's a shame because it's a wonderful text. The story of Simon and of Anna are two people who find their roles in this story of Jesus. This, we think, happens about 40 days after Jesus was born. Still a young baby. And in the middle of a custom that was kind of more routine for his parents, these two prophets find a place in a role. And and it causes us to ask, in this Christmas season, what is the role we are to play? I think the first question we ask, of course, is we have been waiting through the season of Advent. And how do we respond when the waiting finally ends? Simon and Anna in this story have been waiting a very long time. The story really emphasizes that. They have been faithful 
worshiping God in their own way. Simon has been waiting with the direct knowledge given to him by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Lord's Messiah. Anna doesn't seem to have that knowledge, but she has been waiting and serving the Lord in the time of her life. Either way, they both have this moment. A moment when they realize something God is doing in the world. And they praise God. The wait is over. The thing that they have wanted and come, even Anna who didn't know this, but knew the Messiah needed to come for Israel, is now here. This must have been a moment full of emotion. In this tiny baby was all the promise. Their wait had been done. Of course, the end of a period of waiting can be odd. We almost sometimes don't know what to do with it. I remember as a little kid, I would go off to summer camp. And in the weeks leading up to it, I would get real excited. I would start making sure that I had everything packed. At nights, I would wonder about what I was going to do, what hikes I was going to go on. Maybe I'd go canoeing in the lake. All the things that were there. The night before, I could barely sleep in anticipation. But then your parents drop you off, you're there, and it almost took me a day or two to finally kind of get in the groove. I was almost so excited that when the actual thing came, I didn't know what to do with myself. The wait was done, but there still was work to do. We are now in Christmas. Our wait has ended. We are through the season of Advent. But how are we to respond? First, I think it's most simple. Like Simon and Anna, we are to praise God. We are to rejoice and to celebrate. This season is one of celebration. Often, that celebration can die down after Christmas Day. There's a lot to do then. But I encourage you to remember, to pause, take a moment next couple of days and realize that Jesus is here. God is with us. The Christmas message is true. It's something to smile over, to be glad, and to be thankful for. Of course, we know that while our wait is over in Advent, in our lives, we might find, still find ourselves in a time of waiting. In the midst of that, know that one day your wait will be over too. There will be times for celebration. Like Simon and Hannah, you will see what God is bringing for you. But now we celebrate that Christmas message, the one that changes us. One mess a Christmas message, though, that is all not just calm and nice, because the hope and promise of Jesus Christ is true. But there's also, for lack of a better word, a little bit of an edge to it. We see this a bit in Mary's song, where we studied on the last week of Advent, where she talked about the one who came, how Jesus would be good news to the poor, but also might leave the rich going away empty-handed. We talked back then, two sermons ago, about what this really could mean for us. But here, we see this a bit more in what Simon is saying. Simon tells them that Jesus is good news, that Jesus will bring a change for many people, that this is God's long-awaited promise. But then he also warns me, he says that this message will lay some people low. He even warns that Mary, the one who is so faithful in God, will be pierced by this too. We don't know what that is. Perhaps that was just the eventual death of Jesus Christ, or maybe it was those moments in his life in which he challenged a bit of what family might be. In whatever way, we know that Jesus' message will affect even Mary. 
In the same way, Anna reminds us that Jesus brings redemption. And this should not be underplayed. The great potential and great hope that is Jesus is the celebration. It's the focus of our season. But we also must remember that even in the life of Jesus, some people did not respond well to this. In a different year, we would read another text that came in Jesus' early life, the one of King Herod. He's, threatened, he's being threatened by Jesus, and attacking a town. Jesus was a little bit older, and causing Mary and Joseph to flee to Egypt. In his life, although Jesus never raised an army or claimed political power or did anything of taking control, the words he taught and the way he lived were a threat to some. A threat that eventually led them to putting Jesus to death. And, and this is the thing about the Christmas message. It is good news. It is something we should celebrate and live that Jesus is here and wants us to live out his kingdom in the world around us. But we also must remember that sometimes the world will not appreciate this as much. Well, we've talked about it before, but in 1942, a group of Christians in Georgia formed a farm called Koinonia Farm. They wanted to form an intentional community, many of them were Baptists, and, and they wanted to live out the call of Christ's kingdom. The farm, they said, would be guided by four principles. To treat all human beings with dignity and justice. To choose love over violence. To share all possessions and live simply. And to be stewards of the land and its natural resources. This sounds like a good group to have. Sounds like a very calm and tame mission. But in the 1950s, that first call to treat all human beings with dignity and justice caused some controversy. In the rural Georgia, this farm pushed back against some of the ideas that pushed back against some ideas and supported racial justice. They integrated the farming community. They were vocal about God's love of all. And it caused the community around them to push back. They had their produce stand dynamite. Shots were fired into the farm. The Chamber of Commerce took a vote saying they should sell all their land and leave. This small Christian community gathered around very simple principles, pushed back, and made some people upset. We celebrate this Christmas the good news and the redemption of Jesus coming into the world. We celebrate the fact that Jesus walks with us, that God calls us and teaches us how to live. And this is good and great news. But we should guard against Christmas just being a time of warm feelings, over-sentimentalizing it. Because we need to know this good news is powerful. It'll cause some discomfort. And to be honest, I know even for me, much like Mary, this message of Jesus might poke at us too sometimes. And so we definitely should celebrate. But we should also remember the message of Christmas is a powerful one, one that is active and real. So back to that original question we asked, what is our role in this Christmas season? I think this Christmas season we have the role that we have throughout the year. And it is to witness to Jesus in the world around us. The word witness often comes up more in the season of Pentecost, in the time in which we look in the book of Acts and celebrate the first coming of the church. But I think that word fits this story very well. Simon and Anna are by the Holy Spirit inspired by God to notice what God is doing in the world around them. And they tell others about it. 
I love the fact that Simon and Anna are both noted to be very old. They're nearing the end of their journey on this earth. But God still has hope to show them. God still wants to point out and let them see God's wonderful work in this world. And then they still have something to say about it. Simon and Anna don't have to work hard to create something here. No, instead, they simply get the chance to glance at what God is doing and join in with it. When I was young and I would help my dad put up Christmas lights in the house or Christmas lights on the tree, we had back then only the incandescent light bulbs. They burn out a lot quicker than the LED ones today. And we had that infamous problem that if one light went out on a stream, the whole stream would go out. So often, I had the job with my dad, we would plug in all the lights and line them up, and I would get a section, he would get a section, and we'd plug it in, and I would have to tell him, wait a second, these lights are out. And then I would get to look through and try to find the burnout bulb while he would look through it too. And then I'd point and say, here it is, and, and then we would do that. Now, I, in that way, was witnessing to the lights and saying, I see them on, or I see them out. I was proclaiming what I saw. But in a much bigger way, this, I think, is our call throughout the year. Growing up, I was taught a narrow view of the word witness. Mainly, it was used to describe the idea of telling people how I joined the faith and how they could too. And, and there's, that is all fine and good. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think that sells witnessing as an idea too short. Witnessing involves so much more. It's noticing what God is doing in the world and in our lives and proclaiming it in multiple ways. We witness the good and perfect gifts that God has given us. The stars at night, the people who we happen across in our lives, and everything in between. Our witnessing does not have to involve words. We can witness and point out what God's doing in our actions. We can do it in art. We can do it in service to others. We can even do it in a quiet reverence that points in silence to something wonderful. This Christmas, I hope we are led by the Holy Spirit to witness all that God is doing in the world around us. To point out all those ways, subtle and direct, and say, look, God is here. God is with us. Jesus came all those years ago and is with us still today. So this Christmas, no matter how many Christmases it has been for you, maybe it's on the more smaller number side, or maybe like Simon and Anna it is on the larger number of side of years you have experienced. May the Holy Spirit point you to the promise of Jesus working in the world. May we sing, celebrate, and wonder at all we witness in the world around. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you love us and you care for us. I thank you, God, that we celebrate that wonderful mystery that you came down to be with us. God, may we, like Simon and Anna, be guided by the Holy Spirit to see what you're doing in the world around us and witness to it. God, may we never from forget that powerful Christmas message. One that we don't need to soften, but instead embrace all that Jesus offered. Something that makes us uncomfortable at times, but that discomfort helps to bring us to a better, more loving and caring place. Lord, help us love you, seek you. And this Christmas, please show us just a bit of what you're doing in the world around us. God, we know we don't need to see anything. Just what you want us to witness. So God, help us in our small way 
this Christmas to love and to know you more. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We'll be singing Sing We Now of Christmas, number 111 in the hymnal. Jesus in your life and in the world around you. And may the Holy Spirit guide you.